well as um, being the entry to the rains retreat Today is uh, special in the Buddhist calendar because it uh, commemorates <coughs> the traditional date that the Buddha taught his first discourse. And uh, according to the tradition, uh, he uh, attained enlightenment on the full moon in the month of uh, Visakha which is what we know as Visakha Puja or Vesak. And uh, <coughs> then after spending some time at the Bodh Gaya, at the Bodhi tree, he decided to travel to Benares to teach the group of five monks. Now, uh, when <coughs> according to the tradition, of course, they always tell you that this, the, the Buddha taught then the, the Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta, the first sermon and uh, the rolling forth of the wheel of the Dhamma but they, actually this is really the second sermon and the reason why it's called the first sermon is because the, 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 the real first sermon didn't work <laughs> so we're perhaps not that fond of remembering that the Buddha's first teaching was a failure but as a uh, Dhamma teacher myself I find that quite heartening to know <laughs> that uh, even the Buddha sometimes it didn't work on his way from Bodh Gaya to Benares, he met this Ajivaka, a wanderer from the, uh, another sect, from the Ajivaka sect. And this fellow was called Upaka. The word Upaka meaning um, nearly there or not quite. Close enough. And Upaka said to the, remarked to the Buddha that his uh, face or his appearance but there was something special about him he had this air of serenity and radiance to him and uh, asked what is his teaching and uh, the Buddha declared that he just attained full enlightenment and then Upaka obviously <coughs> didn't really believe him and said may it be so friend and departed by another road so that's, that encounter is kind of interesting in a number of ways. One thing, one reason it's interesting is because it's not the kind of thing which you'd expect people to make up. It kind of sounds rather more like a, an actual incident that happened than, than uh, you know, you don't generally make up stories that show that your founder's first teachings was not particularly successful. Uh, so maybe there might be a, uh, it sounds quite plausible historically. But uh, it's also interesting just to notice that people's different reaction and 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 the 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 reason why uh, Upaka was attracted to the Buddha just because of something about him, some kind of appearance of peacefulness. And this is really a very um, uh, very, very powerful thing to remember. As you know, Buddhism is not a proselytizing religion. We don't go around knocking on people's doors and then trying to shove our beliefs into people's faces. We, we have too much respect for them to do this. If you really believe in the, the power and the goodness of the Dhamma, then the best thing you can do is to manifest that. If you can manifest that in your own mind, in your own heart, then that's the best job you can do for propagating Buddhism. I learned this many years ago <coughs> when I was in Perth. I did some... Uh, I had to do some physiotherapy and there was a monastery supporter who was very kindly offered to uh, offer his time to treat me for my knee and uh, <clears throat> uh, he talked about how he got interested in Buddhism he was this kind of Aussie surfer and he used to hang around with a bunch of his mates and uh, he noticed that one of the friends 
would always just had some some kind of special quality, and that they were just doing, you know they're just kind of a bunch of blokes getting up to the usual kind of stuff. But when when things got tense or everyone got angry or something happened, then as one of their friends, he would never never get angry. He would never get upset. And so he would kind of watch this, and then after a while, he just sort of said quietly to him, you know, what is it? You've got something special. What's what's your secret? Yeah. We always get angry and upset, and you stay calm. What's your secret? And he said, "Well, you better come along to the Buddhist Society on a Friday night and listen to some of Ajahn Brahm's talks." So that's how he got introduced to Buddhism. And he said, when he first came along into the Buddhist Society, you could see the hall there and the Buddha image and the kind of the candles and the incense, and it was so weird, you know, it's this kind of weird, exotic kind of thing. And uh, it took him a bit of time to get used to it. Uh, but that's the best way to propagate Buddhism. Yeah? That's the way that the Buddha used. So when the Buddha went to Benares, a similar thing happened when he approached the group of five ascetics. Now these were the companions which the Buddha had uh, before, uh, when he'd previously been doing his ascetic practice. And when he decided to uh, take some solid food, then they left him in disgust. They said he's reverted to luxury. He had a bit of porridge. The backslider. Luxury. So they left him in disgust, went to the deer park, and the deer park is called Isipatana in Benares. Isipatana, literally, Isi means the, the, is a, the Pali pronunciation of the word Rishi, okay, so it means like the sages. Patana means falling down, okay, so it literally means the, the Rishi's drop-in place, okay, where the Rishi's drop in. And uh, that became uh, immortalized and it became explained by giving a story, as all of these things do in the Buddhist text, and the story of that was that there was this group of rishis who had psychic powers, right? And they could fly through the air. So they're flying through the air over the deer park one time, and then they happened to spy some ladies bathing naked in the river near there. And when they did that, they <laughs> when they saw them there, they were distracted from their meditation and. Uh, they fell out of the air into the deer park. <laughs> it's one of the dangers of psychic powers. You've got to be careful. You've got to be careful of these things. So that was very literally the say, the rishis dropping in place. <laughs> the rishis falling out of the sky. So whether that actually happened or not, I, I'm not able to say. So. <clears throat> uh, the Buddha went there, and when the five ascetics saw him. Um, they, first of all, they made a pact and they said, let's not receive this backsliding, luxurious Gotama. He's given up striving. But then when they saw him, they couldn't help themselves. You know, one of them got up and took his bowl, one of them prepared a seat for him, one of them washed his feet. And he sat down. And then he taught them the uh, Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta. And uh, <clears throat> that discourse that he taught uh, forms the kernel of the Buddha's teachings. And in a way we can consider the everything the Buddha taught from there till his Parinibbana is in a sense is just like a commentary and an expansion on, on the themes which he announced in that first sermon. first thing he talked about was what we call the two extremes. And, uh, and these two extremes are the tre extremes of uh, indulgence and of self-mortification. And, uh, uh, the, the, of course, as with all good teachers, the Buddha was speaking from his own experience, because, of course, those two extremes is, is, is precisely what his life consisted of before uh, before re realizing enlightenment. First of all, the period when he was being brought up 
in luxurious lifestyle in the palace where he experienced that uh, indulgence, being able to have anything that he wanted, being able to eat what he wanted whenever he wanted, having everyone looking after him and all of these kinds of things. A life of luxury. And then the opposite extreme of, of self-mortification, trying to torture yourself to realize enlightenment. And so uh, both of those two extremes are based on, um, uh, based on the body, the extreme of indulgence, experiencing enjoyment with the body, the extreme of self-mortification, torturing your body. And uh, <coughs> so the Buddha realized that neither of these things are the way. So when we look at this teaching, then we need to ask ourselves um, where are those two extremes in our lives? Right? Are they? Are we, fol are we following those two extremes? Or do we not? Or how do they manifest for us? Is that something that just pertains to India two and a half thousand years ago? Or is it something which is a bit more universal for human nature? Now, as far as the, stream, the extreme of indulgence goes, most of us are probably quite familiar with that. We live in a wealthy country, most of us materially comfortable and so on. And uh, if we want to, we can, we can uh, afford to indulge our senses in, in whatever kind of delights that we want to seek out. And, you know, it's interesting that, that, that um, even though uh, our culture um, idolizes these things and, and, and values them very greatly, we have this whole kind of advertising culture which sort of is based on supplying material pleasures. We have our economy which is built on ever greater greed and, and uh, productivity and all of these things. Then still... We, at the same time, we're acutely aware of the dangers of this when it's pursued to an extreme. We, we are aware of the dangers of uh, drug addiction. Uh, we're aware of all the, the problems that come when you have um, uh, you know, uh, prostitution, pornography, and so on and so forth. And on a larger scale, we're aware of the... Um, problems with the destruction of the environment and uh, so on and so forth, the exhaustion of resources, extinction of species and blah blah blah, all of which uh, is largely brought about by greed, okay? by, the, by the unquestioned assumption that if I want something I have the right to it and I should get it. So we think we can get more and more and more and uh, so we uh, exhaust our planet. So. That, um, that extreme or that, that, um, that kind of imbalanced way of living uh, gives us a, a short-term sort of gratification, but in the long term can be very painful and very destructive both for ourselves and for others. Now, one of the, then the other alternative is the extreme of self-mortification. Now, of course, you know, if you see self-mortification, I mean, the, the, I don't know if, you, you know if you've read like the Da Vinci Code or something like that, you know, you've got this kind of monk who flagellates himself and stuff, you know. So, obviously, um, those things are done, right? That's not, that's not necessarily a completely false portrayal. I had a monk friend as a Buddhist monk and previously had been a... Um, a Catholic monk, and he used to flagellate himself as a as a Catholic monk. So these things do happen. Uh, it was what was it the, the the famous one, the famous Christian one. He used to live. What was it? I can't remember his name now. He used to live up a pole. None of this none of this luxurious cave dwelling thing. He used to live on a pole. And uh, he used to, he, when he, he got sores and things like that, and the, the flies would come and lay their 
eggs in his wounds and then the maggots would breed and he'd just leave the maggots to breed in his wounds out of compassion for them. And then when they fell off, he'd pick them up and put the maggots back so that they had something to eat. <laughs> so that's pretty out there, isn't it? And of course, so many things that uh, the ascetics in ancient India would do, which, and the Buddha tried most of them, but I mean, people have these, and uh, you know, we saw some of them in uh, Venerable Dhammika's slideshow uh, the other night. And uh, so there are so many um, uh, variations on the theme of tormenting yourself. Like one of them, one of them did a pilgrimage across India, and he had to he went, he decided to go for like I think it was like a two thousand kilometer pilgrimage or something like that. But he decided to, he sort of gritting his teeth and said he'll do it by, by not by walking but by rolling. <laughs> so. <laughs> So you roll, and you know what's on the ground in India at every second step. I mean, it's, it's kind of rolling across <laughs> India. And, uh, yeah, so many different very Anyway, so this is what they, they were doing. And uh, somehow there's this feeling of subduing the body, right? Sort of, uh, it's a kind of, you get this kind of, you know, and you can't deny that, that if you do these kinds of things, that you get you get this kind of like sense of ferocious power, they call it tapas. The Indian word is tapas. And when you just endure beyond endurance, you know, this strength comes into your mind, yeah? You feel like a superman, you can just do anything. Yeah? But that strength is kind of imbalanced. It's not, it's not, it doesn't have that gentleness to it. And so the Buddha tried these things and then said, no, it's not the way. So, <clears throat> Buddhist, anything that we look at in Buddhist practice always has to be balanced and moderate. If it's not balanced and moderate, then it's not Buddhism. Always remember this and never trust it. If, if somebody says, oh, just do X, Y, Z, you know, just have to chant something, Namo Mitopo, and then you'll get, in, that's all you need to do, or just be mindful, that's all you need to do, just do this, just do that. No, that's not what the Buddha said. Okay. The, the practice of, of Dhamma has to... Our, 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 our being is complex. Okay. What we are, how we are, is complex. We have both our inner dimension. Okay. We close our eyes, we look into our mind and what's going on in there. That's already very complex. But then there's also our interaction with each other. Yeah? The social dimension, the cultural dimension, there's us as... Uh, biological beings, we're living in this kind of environment, we have a physical body to nurture, all of these things. And all of those need to be addressed in an integrated and holistic way in our spiritual practice. And so this is what the Noble Eightfold Path is. And so the Buddha said that the, the, the escape from those two extremes is the Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, that path, you should all know the factors of the Eightfold Path off by heart. If you don't, then be embarrassed feel guilty and go off and learn them. First one is right view. Okay? So right view. Right view, the best one way to understand right view is in three stages or three levels of right view. The first stage of right view is simply conceptual right view. Okay? It's what we're doing here. We think about Dhamma, we listen to Dhamma, we reflect on it, we read about it, we discuss it with our friends and um, we refine our uh, conceptual understanding of the truth, okay? And as we do that, we uh, recognize that certain of our ideas, our opinions, our beliefs are maybe irrational or inconsistent or unreasonable, and we abandon those or we modify them, and we uh, realize that certain other of our beliefs are maybe true, and so we gain greater faith in those, we find more reason to believe those, and so on. And so this is kind of ongoing process of checking, correcting, and expanding uh, our right view. This is the first level. The second level is through meditation and meditative realization. So that's when we take those truths which we've learnt and we apply them in our own experience. For example, and we learn that uh, craving is the cause of suffering. Okay, craving, attachment, delusion, desire, this brings about suffering. So, 
we go into our meditation and we look at that. Okay, we test out the, that that uh, theory, that hypothesis. Okay, we don't take it that it must be true because it says so in some Buddhist text. We have to look at it and say, is it true? We question it. And we look into our minds and you look at how craving works, how desire works, how attachment works, and how where does suffering come from when you see tension and worry and so on in your mind. You ask yourself, where is that? Where is that coming from? What's the cause of that? And then you trace that back and you keep on investigating. And so this way you learn to... Um, uh, internalize that uh, right view. That doesn't happen immediately. That's a gradual process. It happens over a long period of time. And each time that you think you've got it, okay, that's thinking. <laughs> that's not getting it, right? <laughs> when you think you've got it, that's thinking. Getting it is something else, right? Don't think you get it, get it. Right? And then the last, and that's the last stage, is the actual getting it. It's like the, re the level of realization, okay? And that level of realization happens when all of the factors of the path come together in balance and harmony, okay? So the eight factors of the path, we need to develop all of them, not just one of them. When all of them are developed, all of them are there, to a sufficient degree, and we can't say what that sufficient degree is, it'll be different for everybody. Okay? Some people will need to do more uh, on the you know, study side. Some people only need, can do a little bit of study, take some simple Dhamma truths and apply that, and that's all they need to do. Uh, some people will need to put a lot of effort into developing their seal or their ethical conduct for a long time before getting any results in their meditation. Other people will go very quickly into deep state of meditation, and so on and so forth. So they're infinitely variable in terms of how we're actually applying it. But in all cases, we need to uh, develop all eight of these factors. When that happens, then that uh, conceptual understanding which we've had ripens and it fruits in letting go. Okay. This is what we call stream entry. So, the first factor is right view. second factor we call samasankapa is right intention. Okay? Now, right intention uh, <coughs> is, an <coughs> is an active force in the mind. Okay? So, this is the, the direction, uh, how we use our mind. Okay? Where is our mind directed? And uh, basically has, has two main... Components. One of them is, is uh, intention towards renunciation. Okay, so any time we have a thought for letting go, for contentment, then we're practicing that second factor of the path, and that's very, very beautifully uh, illustrated by Ajahn Chah. And as so often, Ajahn Chah really just absolutely just cut straight to the heart of things. He said, you know, you've got two apples. One of them's bit bigger and one of them is a bit smaller. And you're going to share one with your friend. Which one do you give him? Yeah. Big one looks nice. I'm sure I'm hungrier than my friend is. So you see all these kind of justifications. So you give them the bigger one. Yeah. And that's that factor. Okay. But the crucial thing is, so you don't have to give your friend both of the apples. Okay. That would be an extreme because you also have to eat. Yeah, that's a cruelty for yourself. Okay, you have two. You only need one. You give them one, but you give them the bigger one or the nicer one. Yeah. And the crucial thing is that you do that every time. We can all do that once or twice. Yeah. You can all do it on their birthday or something like that. But the crucial thing to maintain that consistency of that is to do it every time. Right. And that is precisely where those two extremes come in. The two extremes say, "Ah, oh, I'm feeling so wonderful and, 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 and benevolent today. I'm going to give my friend both the apples. Here you are, have them. And then you go away and then the next day you're feeling, oh, God, I'm really hungry. I didn't get anything to eat. I better have both of them today. Yeah. So 
that's 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 precisely those two extremes, yeah. And so bouncing around between those extremes, and so the middle way is to say, no, no, do you have? Huh? So this is that intention towards renunciation. It doesn't mean you have to flagellate yourself or anything like that. But please don't flagellate yourself. You have to know what's the right thing to let go, okay? And uh, there's a story in the, in the monk's vinaya, the, the monastic discipline. A certain monk uh, heard the Buddha teaching for the le- cutting off of the cords of desire. So he decided to castrate himself. <laughs> Came to see the Buddha. He said, Lord, the Lord speaks in favor of cutting off the cords of desire. Here, I have cut off the cords of desire. And the Buddha said, memorably, he said, you silly man, you cut off what should have been left and left what should have been cut off. (laughs) That's that's a a straight quote from the Pali, I'm not making this up. So, (laughs) you have to cut off the right thing, yeah? And... uh, There's just something about that that um, you know we should develop this this attitude towards renunciation and contentment as as just part of who we are and how we think and and how our, how how we orientate ourselves in the world. Yeah, it's, so it becomes not something which we just do from time to time because we think we should, but it just becomes a very natural part of our character. And. Uh, the more we do it, the easier it becomes. It becomes very natural. So this is that, that practice of intention towards renunciation or letting go. And then the other uh, aspect of that is the intention of um, metta or goodwill or compassion or non-harming. And again, this is something we try to cultivate just as part of who we are. Never to have any sort of sense of ill will, never to have any sense of anger, um, when those emotions do arise in us, just to, just let them go, okay? And to remember that if we are to um, if we are to uh, accept or, or relate to people in a respectful way, then relating to them out of either of these motivations is is kind of is um, demeaning, okay? If we relate to other people as either uh, an object of our desire, something that we have to get, somebody who exists only to gratify our own desires, or if we relate to other people as our enemy, somebody who we've got to beat, somebody who we've got to overcome, then in both those cases we're reducing them. We're we're not treating them with respect. We're not giving them uh, the opportunity to be full uh, human beings. So this is a very kind of sad way to move through the world, yeah? just to think of people in terms of either being, uh, you know, our, our, um, someone we've got to win on our side or something like that, or else someone who's our enemy, we've got to overcome and crush them. So the next factor of the path is the factor of right speech. And of course, right speech is very closely related to right intention, yeah? whatever our thoughts are whichever direction our mind is moving, then this very quickly comes out of our mouths, right? So one of the aspects of right speech is to um, uh, have a bit of a gap there (laughs) between our thoughts and our mouth. And uh, the Buddha said that, uh, it's just a saying, I think shared between the Buddha and Jesus was that they said it's not what goes into a man's mouth that purifies him but what comes out of it and I think that's very true Uh, speech is um, in many ways the 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 foundation or one of the, the defining characteristics of human culture, okay? It's the way that we, um, when we speak, we ex- we express our own consciousness 
in Pali, the w- the word for this kind of, for ex- what we call expression, the word for that in Pali is vinyati, which literally means um, almost like vinyati. Uh, how do you translate that? Means like make. It almost means like kind of making public the 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 the, the, the contents of your own consciousness. Okay, so it's something we have inside us, and we we're, we're putting that out into the world. And you've got to take responsibility for that because you put out all this rubbish and you make the world into a rubbish place. The quality of our speech will very largely uh, affect and determine the quality of our environment, our, human, uh, our social environment. Yeah? If we're speaking in a bad way, if we're speaking in a, in a cynical, negative, mocking way, if we're lying and all of these kinds of things, then we will find ourselves being surrounded by that kind of person. Uh, whereas if we speak in a kind way, in a compassionate way, in an understanding, in a measured way, balanced way, then we will find ourselves being surrounded by good people with similar habits. So be very careful about this. Speech is very, very powerful. Just a few words can create so much pain and they can never be unsaid. The next factor of the path is right action and that refers to the uh, basically keeping the precepts of um, primarily not killing and harming living beings. Okay, so non precept for non violence. Uh, that particular precept is relatively easy for us to keep living in our uh, culture. We don't have to kill to eat. Uh, we can easily get vegetarian food. We can, um, uh, we're not threatened by snakes and malarial mosquitoes and all of these kinds of things. So it's relatively easy to keep that precept precept of not stealing and uh, that <coughs> uh, uh, again most of us we're not in uh, you know a situation where we are uh, desperately poor and, and lacking any food or anything like that so we'd have no real need to be stealing be careful about this and uh, also sexual misconduct and that one's also very um, very important one of the greatest sources of suffering is just that betrayal of our relationships. And uh, many, many people do it. The statistics say that it's what, 40, 50, 60 percent of people will uh, betray their partner sooner or later. And uh, it always causes so much pain and suffering. I won't go into that too much. There was a wonderful talk about that. Uh, those precepts given at the Mitra conference by Venerable um, Mansarakita. So uh, many of you were there, so I won't, won't repeat that. Um, so these are those precepts. And then the next factor of the path is right livelihood. Okay? Now, right livelihood means... Right livelihood is very interesting because it, it, it's an acknowledgement of the fact that we are physical beings, right? We have bodies, and those bodies need food, they need shelter, they need protection, okay? And that uh, part of our lives, which is absolutely essential, is not separate from our spiritual practice, yeah? And so we should try to contemplate a way of living that is um, positive and helpful and at the very least is not harmful, okay? Then the next factors of the path, right right uh, effort, right mindfulness and right samadhi. And uh, uh, I probably won't go too much into right effort for now. Uh, only to note that the right effort in Buddhism, um, think of it more of 
it's more of a, a venerable Tanisara translates it uh, rather than translating it effort translates it as perseverance and I think that's quite a good translation yeah so think of it as perseverance it just means not giving up whatever happens the right effort right mindfulness mindfulness, being aware, being focused, being in the moment, all of those things. And right samadhi is the defined in Buddhism as the four jhanas. And uh, these are very refined, very exalted states of concentration which we reach as a result of our meditation practice. So if we practice as the Buddha said in the, Satipat in the Satipatthana Sangyutta, that somebody who's practicing mindfulness properly and uh, doing their meditation properly will, uh, it's natural that their mind will become concentrated and will go into samadhi. So, I'm not going to go too much into those things right now. Uh, because I've, I've talked about them often enough, but just to remind us all that these are the essential factors of the path. These are the things that the Buddha taught again and again and again. We need to keep to, to bear these in mind. And remember that if we want to, if we have faith in what the Buddha said, if we had faith in the Buddha's enlightenment, we have to remember that these are the things, precisely these things, is what he talked about again and again and again. It's what he told us to do. It's what he encouraged us to do. It's what he wanted us to do. Do we want to be um, uh, worthy followers of the Buddha? Do we if, we, if we, if we really believe that the Buddha gave this ideal of conduct in his life, that he exemplified the best that humanity can achieve, then should we not apply ourselves to ref to reflect, to to aspire to those things that the Buddha talked about? Now, one of the interesting things about the Noble Eightfold Path is not just the things that are there, but the things that are not there. Okay, one of the things that's not there and that's kind of glaring at its omission is is uh, ritual, and this is almost inconceivable within an Indian framework you know you're within a religious framework where everything has been devoted around the ritual the sacrifice and so on and this has been the whole content of religious everything for thousands of years and the Buddha just left it out oh there you go that's not relevant that's not important So sometimes with that, with that Eightfold Path, you know, just to look at that the things that are not there are just as important as the things that are there. And the Buddha said that if there are those practicing the Eightfold Path, then the world will not be short of Arahants. It's one of his final sayings. You know, and it's quite, quite remarkable. You know, you kind of reflect on that and say, well, is that true? Is there anything missing? Right? You try to think, actually, is there anything that's really valuable and important and necessary in our spiritual practice which is not actually there? Okay? Now, I mean, of course, I've only just explained it quite simply and, and many of the factors, as I've explained it tonight, can be expanded. Okay? So we can probably think of things which can be included under an expanded version. But you really can't think of anything essential that, that's not there. And nor has it got anything extra. We try to contemplate and say, well, if we left something off, would it still work? And then you can't, there's no, there doesn't seem to be anything superfluous. So that Eightfold Path is still just as valid today as it was in the time of the Buddha. And it's something which, which I have... Um, <coughs> I have kept this faith in ever since I've been a monk. You know, I've, I've, I've developed and changed a lot over the years. And uh, people who've known me over many years would remark that many of my ideas have changed, the way I do things have changed, and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, one of the things which I've never 
wavered in and which I've never found any cause to doubt is just this, this fundamental belief that uh, a sincere practice of the Eightfold Path does actually lead to liberation, does actually work. And every time that I can see in my practice where I've, I've, I've really tried diligently to do these things, then it's always worked, it's always had that result. Whenever I haven't, whenever I've failed in my practice or I've been lax or whatever, then uh, I can see that, that you know, it doesn't work, the mind starts to fall apart. So we should have a, a tremendous amount of faith in this, this teaching and try to apply it really as best we can. And the Buddha said that through the practice of these things, uh, you realize the Four Noble Truths and this of course being the other um, or the final important aspect of the first sermon the Four Noble Truths, Truth of Suffering, the Origin of Suffering, the Ending of Suffering and the Way of Practice that Leads to the End of Suffering. Now, uh, in, of course it's become almost, almost uh, chronic to, to for Bu and Buddhists become very defensive about this kind of whole thing of suffering, and uh, everyone says, "Oh, Buddhism is pessimistic," and so Buddhists seem to sometimes, um, sometimes get almost kind of paranoid about trying to prove the fact that Buddhism isn't really pessimistic. <laughs> and one of this whole thing, ac actually, historically, it started out with uh, Schopenhauer and the German philosopher, and he was the first one to introduce Buddhism into a sort of European intellectual climate and he himself had a bit of pessimistic overtones and he presented Buddhism as in that light. But uh, of course <coughs> the kind of best way to think about it is that Buddhism is neither pessimistic nor optimistic but realistic. Yeah? When we say that uh, there is suffering then we're not trying to uh, um, we're not trying to make anybody suffer, for a start, <laughs> okay? We're trying to acknowledge that reality. And it's interesting that mm, this problem or this issue must become uh, important for any kind of religious or spiritual path. And you can't avoid it, even if you try to avoid it. And it's been a big problem within all the theistic religions, of course, because if you believe that God created the world, then you immediately have the problem with, well, why is there suffering in it, right? Now, if I was an omniscient and omnipotent and morally perfect creator, I would try to create a world that didn't have any suffering, right? Personally, right? That's what I would want to do. Or if there had to be suffering to teach people a lesson about things, then you'd make it a fairly mild form of suffering, yeah? Maybe a few chilly nights wouldn't hurt them occasionally, or maybe maybe some kiddies need to get a spanking now and then, or something like that. That may be understandable. But, uh, you know, uh, children born with leprosy or with AIDS or something like that, people, and all, there's so many forms of terrible suffering that uh, are completely inexplicable. So this problem, we call the problem of evil, is one of the fundamental dilemmas which faces any kind of theistic religion in uh, Christianity has always struggled with this and has, in my opinion, never come up with an adequate response. Islam uh, is much more straightforward in that and the Quran is very explicit. It says that Allah created good and he created evil. Okay, If you suffer, you suffer not because of anything but because Allah created the suffering for you and Allah is kind and merciful and benevolent. Okay, So this is the Quran. So at the very least, that has the benefit of clarity, okay? So it was obviously an issue which had, was in the air, which they had thought about, which they um, developed a, a rational and consistent response to. In Christianity, there's so many different uh, attitudes preserved in the Bible that it's not really possible to pull a consistent response out of it. But in any case, within Buddhism, these things are not a problem. Suffering is a problem. Suffering is there. Suffering is the reality. Suffering is why we started practicing in the first place. Let's not be afraid of it. Let's not be in denial of it. 
when I saw uh, a tricycle magazine years ago. I remember flicking through this, this tricycle, this kind of American Buddhism magazine, and getting quite this feeling of sort of intense revulsion at all of these happy, smiling faces in this magazine. And, feel, and just thinking to myself, they're not all that happy. <laughs> it's not real. And everyone's like, every teacher is trying to be the happiest one. And I'm thinking, yeah. And then you get to one photo, one photo in that whole magazine had this picture of this Zen monk, either in meditation or just coming out of meditation. And he wasn't smiling. I think he was the only one who wasn't smiling in the whole thing. And he had this, this face of this utter tranquility and this kind of depth of, of, um, of, of just total peace you know, that, that you could see. And, you know, But you can't fake that. You know? So let's not um, let's not be afraid of suffering. Let's not try to um, run away from it or deny it. It's real. We all feel it. Even enlightened beings feel suffering. Even the arahants feel suffering. Even the Buddha himself suffered. Controversial, isn't it? I thought, is it, isn't, isn't the arahant supposed to not suffer? We're told, isn't we told that we practice to realize the ending of suffering? And arahant of the Buddha is supposed to have gone beyond those things and then he doesn't suffer? Yeah. But then you had the Buddha even just before his, his parinibbana. You know, feeling, and it says in the text, it says feeling painful, racking, piercing feelings. My goodness, that sounds like suffering to me. Yeah? When he got sick, he got a bad back, he had to sit in the sun to warm his back. Yeah? So, even the Buddha suffered. I find that quite reassuring, actually. So, how did the Buddha suffer, right? If you think about that, uh, one of the analyses of suffering is the three kinds of suffering. Uh, dukkha dukkha, sankara dukkha, and viparinama dukkha. Dukkha dukkha meaning the suffering of painful feeling, right? And so, painful bodily feeling. So obviously, Buddhas and arahants have the painful bodily feeling. They don't have painful mental feeling, okay? So they don't feel depression, but they do feel physical pain. The next one, oh, viparinama dukkha, is the suffering of change, okay? So. Suffering of change is very subtle, okay, and you have to understand it carefully. The suffering of change does not mean the the um, the worry or the concern that comes when things change, okay, because that's dukkha dukkha. That's the intrinsic suffering, okay. That's depression, right? If you've got a, a new bright shiny new car, and then some kid comes along and scratches a coin along the side of it and ruins the paintwork, and you feel sad because of that, the sadness is intrinsic suffering, it's dukkha dukkha, okay? The suffering of change is the actual change itself. It's a, it's a different kind of thing, all right? Just to give you an example, uh, today, as well as being the entry to the rains and the Asala Puja and the uh, Anagarika ceremony for Jackie, one of our uh, laywomen, we did the Anagarika ceremony, so we now have, I think, eight Anagarikas or something. So all of those auspicious things, it was also Venerable Mudita's birthday, okay? And so, you know, as you do in the monastery, they cooked a birthday cake for him. Now, as you know, when you're eating a birthday cake, you have a slice of birthday cake and you experience a certain amount of pleasure, right? Now, you eat a second slice of birthday cake and you don't experience quite as much pleasure as you had beforehand, right? It's still pleasurable, right? You haven't, you haven't reached the, once the third one, then you're starting to feel not pleasurable at all, right? But with the second one, it still tastes good, but not as good as the first one did. Yeah? That's the, the suffering in change. Yeah? There's no painful feeling involved yet. You haven't got to the third one. But it's still not as good as the first one. That's the suffering of change. Yeah? And then the third kind of suffering is Sankara Dukkha. is simply the suffering that nothing is as good as Nibbana, right? Basically, that's what it means. Everything is conditioned. So even if you're in, a, in the deepest jhana, the deepest state of meditation, whatever, it's not as good as Nibbāna. 
right? That's sankara dukkha. Everything still is still has that kind of activity. So the Buddha still experienced that, right? All of those three things the Buddha still experienced, yeah? and arahant still experienced. So it's important when we understand suffering that it goes all the way down. It goes to the very roots of our experience. It's not just that we, uh, you know. Uh, uh, have feeling a bit ill and we need to get better. It's not just that you know our car needs a service. It's not just that I'm feeling worried about something and I have to calm my mind down. Suffering goes all the way to the roots of existence itself. Okay, and that's what this first noble truth is about. The cause of suffering, of course, is from within, and this is the essential aspect of what the Buddha was saying. Ultimately, the deep level cause of suffering is from within. So. This is not to deny the fact that on a, on a, you know, on an everyday common sense reality that we all experience that suffering often is caused by external things, yes? Government policies cause suffering, exploitative corporations cause suffering, weather causes suffering, you know, all of these kinds of things uh, uh, affect us and they cause suffering. But on the ultimate level, the suffering comes from within our own craving and our own uh, attachments, our own stupidity, all these long lists. So, you know, if you look in the Buddhist texts, they have these long lists of uh, kinds of defilements which people have, various kinds of what they sometimes call afflictive emotions. Or uh, uh, um, in the, the German translation apparently means uh, uh, the shadow in the heart you know, or the clouds in the heart, something like that. So this is even words for and all the kind of the ignorance, the attachment, all the kind of stuff which is going on, and this causes suffering. And it causes suffering in a number of different ways. It causes suffering by making us think in the wrong way, behave in the wrong way, all of these kinds of things. And ultimately, it causes suffering by getting us trapped into the round of rebirth. Okay, so we're still trapped, we're still causing karma, and we're still going to get reborn somewhere, and we're going to cause suffering to ourselves and suffering to others wherever we're born. So the third noble truth is letting go. Okay, mutti, which really means letting go, is the truth of nibbana. So when that cause of suffering, when we let go of that cause of suffering that arises within ourselves, then the result of that is peace. We should not be afraid. We should not be afraid that when we let go that somehow we're going to disappear or somehow uh, we're going to be destroyed or, 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 or that there's going to be some kind of disaster or calamity that comes from that. This is not the case. When one has mindfulness, when one has wisdom and peace in, your heart, in one's heart, when one's practicing out of loving-kindness, when one's practicing with compassion, and when one's able to actually let go of the delusions and the fear in your heart, then the result of that is peace and happiness and joy. And then in our lives we continue to live our lives, we continue to uh, do all of those things in our lives that are really worthwhile and that are really beneficial for ourselves and for others. But the, but the wisdom and the joy and the peace will continue to just grow and grow and grow in a very natural way. This is the outcome of our practice. And when we can realize Nibbana, we will be able to be truly uh, um, uh, um, uh, truly, uh, uh, both at, at peace and at one within ourselves, but also uh, so uh, uh, powerful or effective in creating and spreading peace around us. You know, so the, the example of somebody like a Buddha who, who lived all those years ago, two and a half thousand years ago, all he did was to meditate and to find the truth within himself 
and to share that truth with others. That's basically all he did. Okay, it's very, very simple. And yet, for all of us, all this time later, people all, all around the world, you think about it, every country in the world, every country, there are people like you and I who are inspired by the message of the Buddha, who are practicing the message of the Buddha. It's one of the glorious things that I find as a monk. I travel around all these places and everywhere I go, I meet good people who just want to try to understand the Dhamma and practice it. And so that message is, is still very so vital and so inspiring because it has, it has a reality to it, it has a truth. There's something irreducible about it. Even if we leave aside all of the trappings, you know, all of those things that are not in the Eightfold Path, okay? There's no Buddha images in the Eightfold Path. It doesn't talk about, um, uh, you know, having a kind of Buddhist websites or, or all these kinds of things. You don't have to have, we don't have to upload our videos onto YouTube or anything like that. These are all kind of optional extras. These are the icing on the cake. You leave all of those things apart and just keep to the heart of that practice and that will never and can never cause any harm to anyone if we're practicing this Eightfold Path correctly. It will only lead to benefit for ourselves and only lead to benefit for others. And so all we can do, the best thing we can do with our lives is to try practice these things, to put them into place, we keep on doing the other things we're doing in our lives. But they're all informed and within that context of the Eightfold Path. <clears throat> and we don't know what and when and how the outcome of those things will be. So many stories that it gives of, of say, some of the, 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 the great monks and nuns who became enlightened, Bhadda Kunda Lakesa, she was washing her feet and she saw the, the uh, water, foot washing water, disappear into the ground. And she saw that water dis into the ground, disappear into the ground, suddenly her mind's released. Yeah? You can't predict these things. You don't know when it's going to happen. But what we do know, what we have faith in, is that when all of those factors are there, practice carefully, intelligently, wisely, compassionately, they're all there in place, in balance, in harmony, and they come together. And then the mind will realize the truth and will let go. So this is my talk for you this evening on the Eightfold Path and the Dhamma Chakra Pavantana Sutta.